Good morning, faithful listener. You are listening to the Bible Explained podcast, where the Bible gets explained. So grab your cup of coffee and stay tuned as we read through the book of Deuteronomy. Hello and happy Friday, friends and faithful listeners. Thank you for tuning into this episode. And uh, yeah, there's some exciting things that are going on over here in P40 Ministries land. For those of you who don't know, P40 Ministries is the ministry that sponsors this podcast. In fact, this podcast used to be called the P40 Ministries podcast, but the name was changed in May of 2022 because honestly, the P40 Ministries podcast is not a very good title for a podcast because it doesn't tell anybody what uh, the podcast is doing. So <laughs> that's why the name was changed in May. But yeah, there's some fun things that are going on here in the ministry. You know, I've got some new products that are coming in. I've got some stickers and bumper stickers that are on their way that'll be available in the shop soon for honestly a very reasonable price, in my opinion. So that's another way you guys can help support the Bible Explained podcast or P40 Ministries is by picking up a bumper sticker. But I also rearranged the studio. So now the YouTube videos that I'm producing are going to look better. That's another exciting thing that's going on. And another YouTube video is coming out very soon. I'm going to be talking about modern worship music and why it's not very good. A lot of it. So that'll be a fun topic that I hope you guys are excited about. And uh, yeah, speaking of YouTube, though, my lovely mother, who has been on the podcast a handful of times, is now taking over my YouTube channel. And what I mean by that is she is managing it so that all the old episodes of the podcast are finally like going on there on a consistent basis. And so that is so much work that I'm just so thankful that she is taking over for me. She's doing a great job, in my opinion. So yeah, that's that's exciting stuff. So the YouTube channel is being built by myself and by my lovely mom. So tell me what is exciting in your life right now. Contact me. You'll find my information in the bio of the podcast episode. Make sure to introduce yourself. Tell me where you live, what the weather is in your area, and let me know what an exciting new change is for your life right now. I'd love to get to know all of you guys that are tuning in. But let's go ahead and read Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 10 through 20 today. I'll be reading actually out of the NIV version today. But uh, yeah, feel free to grab the version of the Bible you prefer to read out of. And let's go ahead and read this. Deuteronomy 20, 10 through 20 to the end of the chapter. And don't forget to grab that cup of coffee of your favorite coffee or your favorite cup of tea. And let's discuss this together. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offering of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to the sword all the men in it. As for the women, the children, and the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves, and you may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. This is how you are to treat all the cities that are at a distance from you and do not belong to the nations nearby. However, in the cities of the nations the Lord your God is giving to you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things that they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. When you lay siege to a city for a long time, fighting against it to capture it, do not destroy its trees by putting an axe to them, because you can eat their fruit. Don't cut them down. Are the trees people that you should besiege them? However, you may cut down the trees that you know are not fruit trees and use them to build siege works until the city at war with you falls. So these are the rules of war for the Israelite people. And verses 10 through 15 are talking about the nations that surround Israel that the Israelites might have to go to war with that weren't included in the inheritance of the promised land, if that makes sense. So these were like the surrounding nations that might try to go to war with Israel. Now, we do know that Israel was not really supposed to start any wars, if I'm remembering that correctly, but they could go to war if there was another nation that was... Uh, you know, going up against them. But I am pretty sure we talked about a, a portion of scripture where God told the Israelites like not to expand their borders of the promised land. 
And uh, that was God telling the Israelites basically not to conquer the world. So the Israelites for the most part, we're not supposed to instigate a lot of battles unless God specifically told them in that moment to instigate a battle, but they could defend themselves. So it says, when you march up to attack a city, make its people an offering of peace, an offer of peace. What nation like goes up and offers them peace? Most people would just go to war with them immediately. But this is kind of God showing his mercy through the Israelite people that instead of just going and attacking these people, first the Israelites could make them an offering of peace. And if they accepted that offer of peace, then everyone could survive in that city. However, they would be subjugated to forced labor. And we know that uh, in ancient days around this time period, that was a very common thing was forced labor. But really, if you think about it, this is not the worst thing for that city. First and foremost, they're going to be able to, to survive after trying to attack Israel. <laughs> so that's the, the main reason why this is not the worst option for them. And secondly, if you look at the rules for how the Israelites were supposed to treat their servants and slaves, even slaves from different countries, because yes, God did allow slavery. I've talked about that a lot on this podcast. And honestly, I don't really want to go into it too much again today, the reasons why God continued to allow it. But when you see the rules of how the Israelites were supposed to treat their servants and slaves, you can see that God actually really cares about servants and slaves. He cares a lot about everybody. And slavery in the Israelite nation, if it was done, if it was done correctly by God's standards, was not the worst thing. It was actually a way to save people a lot of times, like save them from debt, save them from being killed in this situation, save them from a life of uh, misery because they could become a slave and be taken care of and become part of the family of the family that they are serving. So this isn't the worst possible thing. And even the rules God gives to the Israelites regarding uh, servants from foreign countries, which would be in this case, the Israelites were supposed to treat their servants with respect. But the final way that this is not the worst possible outcome for this city is because they would be integrated into Jewish society at this point. By becoming a servant, they would almost become like part of the Jewish community. And when they became part of the Jewish community, all of a sudden they now have different laws, different rules, and they are covered by God's grace under the Jewish law. So in many capacities, this is uh, God showing mercy to this city that was trying to go out and attack Israel and trying to instigate a war. God is showing them a great mercy by allowing them to live and not just live, but potentially thrive as a now Jewish convert. And then on top of that, they through Jewish conversion, they are now under God's law and are forgiven through that. So after this, it says, but... If they refuse to make peace and they engage with you in battle, lay siege to that city. So laying siege to a city would mean like surrounding it and like cutting off the supplies until they are forced to surrender. Now, when the city eventually surrenders, the Israelite men were supposed to go in and put a sword to all the men in it. I've talked a lot about this also, about how the men of this time period, because this is, don't forget, this is ancient culture. We don't live under the same rules nowadays. This is ancient culture. And something that was huge in ancient culture and would have been widely recognized at this time period was the idea that men were supposed to be uh, the protectors and avengers of their families. And this would have been taught to all boys of all ages. This was just a cultural thing. So when God says to get rid of all the men in this city... He is removing this like constant war that would be going on because if these men were, let's say, captured along with the women and children, the men would constantly be warring. And now this time instead, it would be inside Israel instead of uh, <laughs> instead of like warring outside of Israel. So really, it would be a, a huge problem. So God does say to put a sword to all the men that are in this city. If the city refuses 
to make an offer of peace. However, the women and the children could go and become forced laborers to Israel under the same rules as what we just talked about. And also the livestock and the plunder in the city the Israelites could take for themselves. Now, the plunder that the Israelite men would take home and all tribes at this time period, the plunder is what paid the war uh, expenses and would pay each soldier in a, in a way that would be their payment for, you know, going out into war. You may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from your enemies is what it says in verse 14. This is how you are to treat all the cities that are at a distance from you and do not belong to the nations nearby. So there's there's a lot of mercy going on here. And I know that in our cultural, you know, Western lens, we look at this and we're like, oh, God is so mean. But really, how is this mean? And potentially this this city was the one that tried to first and foremost instigate a war against Israel. The city wasn't going to show mercy to Israel if they won. But yet God is giving these cities so much mercy and not just mercy, but also these people could be integrated into Jewish society. Maybe not in the way that you and I like to hear about, but you got to look at the entire picture of what God is saying here and the rules regarding servants and slaves in the Old Testament. I mean, there are so many rules that showed that God cares so much about every human being including servants in the Old Testament. And what's more is you and I are considered servants of Jesus nowadays. And there's a there's an amount of freedom <laughs> that is talked about with that. You know, you don't often think that uh, servant and freedom go hand in hand, but being a servant of God is freeing because we aren't, we are, we are no longer like slaves to death and destruction and whatever else we cause for ourselves. Instead, God freed us from all that when we choose to serve him with our lives. But moving forward, verses 16 through 18, it talks about the promised land. And God basically says that in this circumstance, the Israelites were not supposed to leave anybody alive. The Amorites, the Hittites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites were too far gone. This was an act of judgment that God was showing on these nations in the promised land. And this is a rare occurrence, I should mention, uh, God doling out this type of, of judgment on people. We see it happen a handful of times in scripture, one with uh, the flood, another time with Sodom and Gomorrah, and now we see it happening here with the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Which is quite interesting because um, when you look at how God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, he actually did not destroy Egypt. He did not completely destroy Egypt, even though Egypt was worshiping multiple other gods and doing all sorts of crazy stuff themselves and uh, torturing his people. God showed his power to the Egyptian people to like pull the Egyptian people towards him so that they would stop worshiping those other gods that they were worshiping and begin worshiping Yahweh God, which is fascinating. So when God doles out this type of punishment, like complete and total destruction, there's no there's no more chance, honestly, for redemption. So clearly the Egyptians had not gotten so bad that God had to fully destroy them, but uh, the Canaanites had. So that's what God says here. Do not leave anybody alive from the promised land, basically. And God actually says why in verse 18. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things that they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. So in order to keep his people, his people, he tells them to completely destroy the Canaanite nation. We're going to see this happen. Now, I should mention that there is, I would guess, an exception to this rule. Because if you look at the story of Joshua in the next book after this, where he marched around the city of Jericho and was going to completely destroy the city of Jer Jericho, there was a woman in that city named Rahab who believed in God, even though she was, you know, a, a, I don't know what the people of Jericho were, even though she was of that nationality of Jericho, God saved her and God blessed her 
and saved her family also because of her faith in Yahweh God. And so, yes, there were exceptions to the rules, I should mention, even with this. And we can see that through the story of Rahab, the prostitute. But anyway, otherwise, the Israelites were supposed to destroy the Canaanite region. Then in verse 19, when you lay siege to a city for a long time, fighting against it to capture it, do not destroy its trees by putting an axe to them because you can eat their fruit. Do not cut them down. Are the trees people that you should besiege them? (laughs) That's kind of interesting. An interesting thought. I know that one thing the Romans used to do, they would like salt the land to like destroy it. And that caused a whole lot of damage. And I think this is almost like what God is trying to say not to do is like totally destroy the land because that's ridiculous and that causes a lot of unnecessary trauma to the earth. And so, yeah, I mean, the the trees are not people. They didn't sin. So there's no point to cut them down. But God does say in verse 20, however, the trees that you can cut down are the ones that you can use for wood, basically, until the city falls. But the fruit trees don't cut those down because You can eat the fruit. Like, why would you cut the tree down? The tree can't sin. So what God is preventing there is just unnecessary damage to the land. So the way the Romans would go and like salt the earth and and spread fire to everything. That was just unnecessary damage that did not need to happen. And from my understanding, I think there's still some areas of the world that the Romans like salted that still don't produce like... uh, good crops or something. I'm not sure about that. If you know the answer to that, let me know. Contact me and uh, tell me if you know if there's still areas of the world that the Romans salted that still don't produce good plants. But anyway, guys, to wrap up this episode, what this is really talking about is, in a sense, God's mercy, even towards people who were warring against the Israelites, minus the Canaanites, who uh, didn't, you know, follow God's laws. You know, God shows a lot of mercy to everybody and he he gives so many second chances. And you can see that even with the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. In a way, God was giving them another second chance, I guess, when the Israelites were wandering around the wilderness because they couldn't go into the promised land. God was giving the Canaanites extra time to turn back to him. So, I mean, there's always a second chance that God gives always. There's very few times in scripture where you see God fully, utterly destroying a place. And when he does do that, you can see that multiple chances are given for them to turn away. Even with the flood way back in the ancient days, there's actually a verse in scripture that says that the spirit of God was going around warning people to turn away from their wickedness and get on the boat with Noah. There's a verse that mentions that in, I think, first or second Peter, which I found quite interesting. So, I mean, there's always second chances God gives. So, you know, if if you feel like, you know, God can't forgive you for whatever reason, know that that is not the truth, first and foremost, because God's power is so unlimited. He can forgive you for literally anything. And I mean, these people way back in the Old Testament that were doing crazy things like child sacrifice and, and whatever else. God was continually giving them second chances until they just refused completely to obey God. And even though God is merciful, there is a point in time where he does eventually act. So I think that that is a warning to us. God's mercy is so wonderful and it's so great, but it's not unlimited. So in a sense, turn away now while you still can, because God can and will forgive you for whatever thing that you think that you can't be forgiven from. But do it while you can. Anyway, friends and faithful listeners, I do hope you enjoyed this episode. And actually, the YouTube video that I'm going to be talking about very soon kind of talks a little bit about uh, what we discussed today. So go to the YouTube page. You'll find that linked in the description of this podcast episode. Go over there and subscribe if you haven't yet so that you don't miss out on the great YouTube content that is coming your way. Friends and faithful listeners, I will see you tomorrow. No, I won't. I'm sorry. Tomorrow is the weekend. (laughs) I'll see you Monday for an episode out of Deuteronomy. We're going to be moving into Deuteronomy chapter 21. But have a wonderful weekend. I hope that you 
feel uh, nice and refreshed on Monday morning when we dive into Deuteronomy chapter 21. Happy listening and God bless. Thank you.